Hey everyone, it's Larry Berman here. Uh, another uh, incredible week in, in terms of global equity markets. We learned an awful lot this week, uh, both from the Federal Reserve, from, from the uh, August 2nd announcement of the quarterly refunding. We commented last week that that was going to be a big, big uh, point this week. We saw a tremendous amount of Treasury supply needed over the next couple of quarters. And Janet Yellen, as expected, is going to need a lot more uh, coupon debt and duration than the market was ready for. So let's dig into the chart room and see what we learned. Japanese government, 10 year government bonds. This is a chart going back, uh, as you could see, back to the late 1980s. And you can see the very, very high interest rates that we had seen over the years. Now, in Japanese terms, 8% isn't very high, but you can see as we blow this chart up and look at recent years where the 10 year JGB went negative. So Japan, starting in around 2013, uh, implemented a policy on what they called yield curve control. And what they did was they said, if 10 year JGBs got to a certain interest rate, we would buy all that debt. And so as it turns out, the Japanese government owns just about all of the outstanding debt. In fact, in Japan, the central bank owns the vast majority of ETFs that were ever issued that represent Japanese securities. So you, you've got this incredible imbalance where they've, they've so aggressively stimulated their economy to try to create some growth and in inflation and have completely failed until this lift in recent years triggered by COVID, caused by an expansion of, of deficit and debt in the world in the last couple of years, uh, shortages, rebalancing of global supply chains, now causing these supply-based issues uh, that have, um, have really changed the world quite dramatically. Last week, we heard from the Japanese government, central or Japanese central bank, that they are abandoning their, their notion of, of yield curve control, they don't call it that. But effectively, you can see that for the last couple of years, they've let the band expand. And now it seems like, yes, it's still that kind of general thought, but they've had to come in twice this week on an emergency basis and buy in debts because yields were expanding way uh, higher or faster than they had hoped. If you look at the Japanese 30 year, you can see that the long end of the curve has actually shot up pretty significantly uh, in recent years and is, is heading back to where, where there's an actual term premium in long term debt, i.e. I'm assuming interest rate risk, you better pay me more than inflation. Uh, where in most of the world, that's really not the case. Although now with inflation coming down, we're having to see more, we're seeing some uh, semblance of positive real yields uh, develop. And it's that term premium in, in, in the bond market that's been missing for an awful long time in recent years and is, is really needed to, to keep interest rates down. Um, so when, when you look at the next announcement, i.e. how much debt the government needs, the, the number was supposed to expected to be 700-ish um, uh, a billion. It was over a trillion. Uh, their mix of coupons and bonds is significant in the coming quarters, uh, back towards that 80-20 uh, mix that we talked about last week. If you look at the Congressional Budget Office forecast, again, we looked at this last week um, on Berman's call and, and here, and you look at the deficit uh, to GDP in the US, you know, running uh, a structural deficit, which they're not gonna have much of a choice now, just because the interest costs are pushing up over a trillion dollars a year, that number as a percentage of GDP is just gonna keep growing. And so half the deficit annually running now around 4% of GDP uh, because the debt outstanding is bigger than GDP in the U.S. today. The interest rate costs, what percentage they have to pay of it becomes, you know, just purely debt financed. 
And so discretionary spending is the other piece of that. Um, and, and that's rising as well. So the budget debate that we're going to get in September and October is going to be about that. But in no way are they going to be able to fix, you know, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. It's just untouchable politically. And um, the, the U.S. structure is, is, is dire from a debt perspective. You tell that to an American and they, they don't believe you. But as an outside observer, you see that and it's crystal clear. It doesn't mean you should go buy Bitcoin, by the way, folks. That is not a hedge to any of this stuff. And anybody purporting that is is a big shill in my mind. So you have this tremendous debt coming. You have this sticky inflation. We saw this week in the employment uh, report out of the U.S. Again, core wages, sticky, uh, you know, north of 4%. I think with all the union settlements we're getting, we're going to see that continue. And ultimately, if the cost of capital is going up, risk premiums need to rise and the multiple on stocks needs to come down. So for the first time in months, we have seen a lower weekly close on the S&P than the previous week's lows. We had a number of, of, of weeks in here where we dipped and we tested, but in no time did we get a closing lower low than the previous week's low until this week. So what does that mean? Well, the last time that happened in a significant way was here and here and here and here. And so probably some degree of follow through. How much? Well, at a minimum, there was a lot of selling for months and months and months. Every rally, 41, 4200, we saw it in here and ultimately we broke out. So. I think that's where the most important support is on any test, 41 to 4,200. I think almost certainly in context of the supply in the next couple of quarters and the likelihood that longer term rates move up and we have to increase our discount factor for forward based earnings, that the multiple comes down. Multiple comes down two percentage points from 21 to 19. If we get 220 in earnings, which is the, you know, forward forecast, it's 215 times 20, you do that, that's 4,300. So unless you're going to argue for the multiple expand in this market, you're an absolute fool if you think markets could be higher than they are today. Ed Yardeni, I welcome a debate with you on this because I have no idea what you're seeing. And I know you're a, a cheerleader for the markets uh, and have been for your entire career, but it would be really interesting, um, you know, to, to have a debate with you. Now, why would you debate with me? I don't know. I'm just a portfolio manager who runs some a few billion dollars that, that has a, a an opinion on on valuation and where things will go. But anyways, I won't get into that. Again, no bull and bear pick of the week because there's not really right now anything that is cheap enough that I would want to come out and say buy. But put on your radar utilities that are getting really cheap as interest rates are rising. Some of these utilities are getting pounded. For those ZWU lovers out there, the levels are just really attractive and the yields are quite stable up here um, at these levels. So uh, there are some things to buy. And if, if there's a bull pick of the week, that's it. Having said that, I liked it a dollar higher too, folks. And it's it's really getting uh, uh, crunched here. Uh, but that looks very interesting for the yield seekers out there. But for everybody else, caution, caution, caution is the message. I've been advocating this for months now and in the short run i look pretty dumb with equity markets going up but now we have the structure and set up in place where at least we're going to come back to those levels we'll be able to cover some of our uh exposure in in there if the hard landing scenario plays out there's no way earnings can grow over the next year earnings will fall the multiple will fall and that's where you get back to a test of the 2022 lows in in a harder landing scenario we have no visibility on that until we actually see job losses and companies start reporting bad numbers so when we look at earnings season that's 75 percent in the bank right now 
Over 80% of companies have beat on the bottom line, largely through expense management. And the ones that are beating, which is higher than last time, but they're beating by a lower amount. Very important learning there. And the number of companies beating on the top line on revenues are only 60%, which is worse than expected and down from last time. So it's clear the headwinds are building slowly. And as we've said for a long time, end of the business cycle is not uh, an event. It's a process. And the process takes time. That transmittal of monetary policy takes time to work through. And we still have quarters in front of us where higher for longer is going to be central bank policy. There's not a chance they cut interest rates unless we see duress in financial markets and a hard landing. And if we get the hard landing, equities have no business at this level. Hate to be the deliverer of that message, but it is what it is from my uh, crystal ball. Have a great week, everyone.